beyond our drug services. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, yes, it just occurred to me. You've got a website here, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and now do, on that website is say a PayPal button or something? Yes, we have a donate button on I think every page of our website. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. You know, yeah. so I promote that. You know, yes, that's, yes. So get money that we, way. We were really lucky, you know, um, when we found out we were being displaced, you know, on top of trying to find a new place to house our services, um, we were really worried about the cost of moving our entire program and renovations and all that kind of stuff. It's the kind of thing that you would want to run a two year long capital campaign for, right? And we didn't have that luxury. So we were really fortunate we had an, um, a matching donor who contributed $25,000. And our goal was to get the community to raise a matching $25,000 in a month. And um, we set up a GoFundMe page and we raised that amount in three days. Um, so we had a, we were just really, really heartened by, um, we ended up raising 75000 from that GoFundMe campaign in October. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we definitely have been feeling a tremendous amount of love and support from the community, um, which we're really grateful for. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Some statistics, the number of clients? Sure. So we have um, 3,500 like unduplicated medical records. Um, what that means is that, you know, in the course of our 16 years of existence, there's 3,500 people that have used us as their primary healthcare provider. Um, on top of that, there's people, you know, there's tens of thousands of contacts that we make through our street-based outreach um, that we're not really able to unduplicate, you know what I mean? And then our needle exchange, I would say we're probably Oh, at our current location, one of the slower needle exchanges in the city, but at this location, I imagine we might see more people. Um, so, you know, on top of the 3,500 clients that receive, like, medical care from a physician, um, there's the people that we see in street-based outreach and needle exchange. Do, do you have any kind of an annual client it's, count? Um, annually, just the 3,500 is over. How many years? Yeah, that's over our whole existence. Which that's is how many years? How, how 16. Oh, 16. Yeah. I would say the easiest way for me to conceptualize of it is, because um, I do have annual visits, but a lot of people come to us every week. Sure. And so sure. um, that is probably, we probably have about 5,000 visits a year. 5,000 visits. visits. But that could be people coming in for the clothing closet mm -hmm. every week. And that's good, so it's obviously you do get it. Yeah. For our lower threshold services like um, needle exchange, or if you're just picking up a food bag, or if you're just accessing the clothing closet, um, it's harder for us to deduplicate those. So what is about the annual um, agency budget? Currently, our budget is about 750000 I'm with the Friends of Bodeca Park, yeah. and uh, uh, we don't have uh, an opinion. I personally support the organization. In fact, I'm also with Senior Disability Action, which oh. is 1360 Mission. Oh, you're so in we're the same boat. Yeah. possibly facing the same issue. Yeah. I will say, I know because I know their location, yeah. and it was literally right next to uh, a, a family housing, yeah. Mercy Housing, and I'm not aware of any problems. Uh, but um, what I wanted to know regarding to the park, I recommended, and I don't know if you've had a meeting with um, people, uh, the uh, site director, uh, who's Michael. Michael, Long, I've met with him a few times. Mike yeah. with uh, the yeah. Boys and Girls Club, the yeah. YMCA, um, and the uh, um, Safe Passage. Safe Passage. Yeah. Uh, if there were any concerns at all, yeah. so and you have been meeting with them. And yeah, they haven't. Um, they haven't expressed any concerns to me so far. We um, okay. we held our prop eye meeting at the Bodecker Park Rec Center and worked with Michael on that. Okay. Um, I also know Matthias um, Romino okay. very well. Yeah. Um, okay. I used to work in as a legislative aide to the Board of Supervisors when oh. Matthias was oh. in there. So yeah. okay. I was excited to see that he was working the safe passage. Um, we I don't anticipate there being any issues. I mean, I was I'll say I was very excited. You you can picture 1372 Mission because we were neighbors. Yeah. Um, we haven't had any outdoor space or any you know, staff break.
celebration, so I was very excited for my staff to be able to sit and eat their lunch in the park. You know, yeah. um, I'm, I'm really tickled to be next to the park. Um, but I don't anticipate any kinds of issues. Our, because the patients that we see are from such a vulnerable population and a lot of people, you know, we don't have a sign out on our window or anything like that because we want to be very discreet and if people are not, you know, are, um, need to be, um, you know, anonymous when they come through our doors, we, we don't advertise what we do. Um, and so we don't typically have people like lining up outside. You know, we really do our best to just get people in and out. So um, I don't see there being any issues. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, um, we have Tenderloin Health Improvement Partnership presenting um, Abby Yand. Um, we got about 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Abby Yant, I work up at St. Francis Memorial Hospital, and I have some colleagues with me today, Jennifer Laxon and uh, Will Douglas. Um, back up a little bit. So okay, yeah, yeah, no, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, 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 thank you. And um, we, uh, we are a partnership with St. Francis Foundation, um, which uh, raises funds to support the community and the hospital. Uh, and we began a Tenderloin Health Improvement Partnership um, about two years ago now. Um, where we took what, um, uh, there's a, a planning process that takes place every three years in San Francisco where we look at the health needs of the community across the city. I've been involved in that many times. Um, hard to go. Because <laughs> we need to connect because the hospital is just sure. share, share a uh, interest. Um, so anyway, we um, definitely um, have worked, with, so we took the community health needs assessment and uh, one of the things that we had learned in, during that process was uh, many residents of the community that had provided input um, were um, wanted to be involved in the solution as well as just identifying the needs so we took the uh, needs uh, back into the community here in the Tenderloin um, and invited about 160 different um, organizations in the city to or in the Tenderloin to come and help us uh, design uh, strategies for improving the health of the residents in the Tenderloin. Um, we did that. We went through a pretty uh, rigorous, uh, very open uh, process, a uh, series of meetings where we discovered that the community, uh, to, to no surprise to people in this room, I'm certain, um, rank ordered sort of the strategies for improving health around uh, community safety, uh, connections, you know, human connection and healthy choices. And so uh, that seems very um, different coming from a hospital that we would be coming out looking at safety concerns. Uh, so uh, it's been a learning process. We've designed a, a, a structure on how to do this that we have a steering committee that is part of the hospital and foundation's uh, governance structures. Um, and it has a, a, a large number of uh, community members that participate in that. We, um, and then we, in, when we were designing the strategy, not only did we prioritize the strategies, but we narrowed the focus. Uh, as you know, depending on how you define the Tenderloin, it's, uh, it, it's, any, it's usually somewhere around 40 square blocks, 33,000 people. Um, pretty daunting uh, numbers to uh, to challenge ourselves to improve upon. So, with the help of many in the community, um, we uh, did data analysis. Uh, we have uh, lots of expert uh, experts helping us from the health department, from the police department, uh, from various organizations um, to help us sort of define where the the sort of assets and challenges were in the community. And so we began to narrow our focus and uh, to, to look at where we could start. 
because you got to start somewhere, you know, to change the world one, one, one day at a time. <coughs> so we've, we narrowed our focus, and the other thing that helped us narrow our focus to a defined area of 10 square blocks within the Tenderloin, um, we looked at opportunities. So the biggest one in front of us at that time was the, uh, at that time was the pending reopening of Bodeco Park. Um, and we were able to define that as an, as an action zone. Um, then we looked at other action zones um, around the area over near uh, Leavenworth where the Tenderloin Museum was going to open and there was a lot of activity happening there. And then we looked down on the Gold Gate Avenue uh, with uh, a number of, of activities happening, sort of this health clinic row. Uh, there was the, um, the, the pending <coughs> sort of ousting of Big Boy Market. <coughs> everything that has ensued in that area. So we started taking this approach of looking at action zones. And, um, and it, was, uh, it was really uh, kind of a new idea that kind of uh, galvanized people, got people kind of energetic about how they could come together around those particular areas and, and work together differently. Uh, so, so that's what we began to do. We identified a need when um, the city was reopening Bodecker. Um, they hadn't identified any funds for um, the, the staff work that um, had, is now in place at Bodecker. So we were able to, um, as Boys and Girls Club became the um, anchor tenant for the uh, Rec and Park building, uh, we were able to support them financially to be that anchor tenant and to do the type of programming they're doing that's very inclusive of the whole neighborhood. And I know that Betty sits on the Friends of Bodecker uh, Advisory Board that, that, again, is very inclusive and uh, really uh, is we've been very sensitive to the fact that, you know, we're sort of a you know big institution up on the hill that doesn't really live and breathe in the Tenderloin, although we take care of the residents of the Tenderloin on a daily basis in our emergency department and hospital. So we've, we've been very sensitive to the fact that the residents and the organizations that work with clients in the, in the Tenderloin know a heck of a lot more than we do. And so we do a lot of convening and facilitating and helping people work together. We also uh, bumped into, during this time that we were doing our planning process, the city's Office of Economic and Workforce Development was refreshing the Central Market Plan um, that had been in place at that time for a few years, and the, you know some of the new tech companies had moved in, and things were starting to shift, and they wanted to kind of get in front of that a little bit and think, go, think going forward about how things could continue to change. And we bumped into each other, and they recognized that we had developed this ability to convene many, many nonprofit organizations. And they took upon themselves to challenge to convene 30 city agencies um, that are now we're working together. They, they, they do all the convening the city agencies. We do a lot of facilitation of the, of the private sector and nonprofit sector. And we're working together in very specific ways to, to really create strong, strong public-private partnerships. Um, Bodecker is probably the strongest example of that, where we've really helped the Rec and Park think really differently about how they manage community parks. Um, you know, when that conversation first began, they were kind of using a sort of formulaic think of how they would uh, staff and organize that park, and we were with the community's help, we're able to really make it clear that that little acre served, um, you know, a, a huge number of people, disproportionate to any other park land in the city. So I think those kinds of things, and you know, and, and keeping the focus on health. This is really 80% of any of our health is really based on lifestyle and where we live. Um, and so this community has a lot of disadvantages uh, because of the way that the the, the community uh, that whether it's the public sector, whether it's um, drug dealing, you know, all the things that contribute to the ill health of the community or prevent well people from being able to move about the community and make those healthy choices and go to the you know, farmer's market and, and do those types of things. Um, there's many inhibitors for that. So we've been able to really, I think, shift focus for, for uh, the city and the community and learning how to work together and just staying really hyper-focused um, on those areas that I mentioned, um, and it's not to the exclusion of everything else that's going on, but it, uh, we are, we're very much aware of uh, the ripple effects that happen as a result of some of the changes that we've been able to help uh, manipulate. 
So that's uh, so. I, as I said, we uh, we uh, ordered our priorities, uh, our strategies around safety, connection, and healthy choices. Uh, we also uh, recognize that we have a very uh, complex underpinning of difficult uh, social issues of homelessness, mental health, and substance abuse um, that plague many of our residents of the Tenderloin. And so those issues we also work on, but in very different ways. Um, you know, working with the, the public sector and looking at you know policies and housing and all of those really difficult issues. Um, so we're we do not ignore those issues, but we also are not um, uh, fooling ourselves that we think that we can be the one that's the, the sole uh, agency that, that uh, has a great deal of influence and changes it, but we are at the table, if you will, and advocating for and on behalf of, of folks to get the kind of um, um, resources that are required to, to uh, maintain their health, um, certainly the, the, the health of residents that that live on the streets with mental illness and substance abuse, their health condition is abysmal. Um, and we, um, we, we care for these people on a, a very on, on a constant basis in, in our hospitals. And so we, we're quite aware of, of how difficult that is and how, uh, how it, that ripple effect is, is equally difficult. So um, I think that kind of sums up what we're doing. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Yes. Yeah. Um. Yeah, uh, I know some homeless people, and in uh, uh, um, what what, and, and also I know some people that are housebound, and these are both health health issues. Um, and uh, one of the things that I think maybe homeless need is some place with it they can go to for urgent care before things get so bad they have to go to the emergency room. And um, this is, um, you know, uh, uh, and sometimes people get shuttled around because people, doctors and, and uh, uh, well, I should say medical personnel don't want to deal with homeless people and they've already got a set idea of what they're dealing with. And that's not always particularly true. Um, and as far as people that are housebound, people need uh, uh, health care professionals that can do visits. Uh, I have a friend that um, uh, couldn't get, she lives out in the avenue, she could not get anyone to come and give her a flu shot. You know, uh, uh, and then finally she got somebody who said, yes, I'll come and give you a flu shot, but first we've got to have some intake visits, and we've got to have this, and, we, and it's 200 bucks a visit. So this is there needs to be um, there needs to be some kind of structure, and since your people are into doing structure, some place, some way that people can be seen by doctors that can't get out of their homes, and some way that people who don't have homes can be seen by doctors who will refer them to specialists who will actually take their problems serious before they balloon into something that cannot be handled. Yeah, I mean, the improvements in the health delivery system is uh, something that Tenderloin Health Improvement Partnership is working on on a limited basis in that, you know, we're working with the healthcare providers in this community to try to help uh, knit. We're all in the age of health reform where we're trying to knit together a fragmented system. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are working on that in, in very big and long-term ways. The other uh, that I would say, just because I am an RN and I have done hospital administration, um, I do more community work now than healthcare mm -hmm. administration. But um, I will say that you know I've seen in this community and San Francisco at large, there's a a, 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 a big uptick in urgent care centers and um, mm -hmm. and there's a couple of new providers that are doing home care visits and you know there are and the big systems are starting to really understand and as the the way that uh, healthcare providers get paid changes, that will change as well. Right now, mm -hmm. everybody's paid, you know, for you to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be paid for the doctor to keep you well. Mm -hmm. okay? My friend. And so as that yeah. changes, they're going to figure out that some of the innovations that you suggest are cost effective. Well, my friend that couldn't get someone to come in and give her, give her a flu shot is going to the hospital as we speak, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I, I almost. 
thank God her granddaughter was able to, 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 be, to be there in 10 minutes. Otherwise, you know, I would, I, there would not have been a meeting today, mm -hmm. today okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a big issue because uh, I'm also with senior disability.